Carolyn Rye again, school board chair. We're reconvening the formal meeting at 8.49 p.m. Uh, after concluding with our in-person speakers, uh, we are now ready to uh, continue with our Zoom speakers. Madam Clerk. Thank you. Our first Zoom speaker is Lindsay Nathaniel. Please unmute. Welcome. People of all races have expressed pain, frustration, and anger over the mistreatment of Black people in America. Black people and other people of color are beyond fatigued in explaining, demonstrating, pleading, and articulating the realities of racism. At the foundation of the crisis we're in today is the inability of white people to understand the lives of people of color. Let's be clear. Systemic racism is a corrosive and widespread problem in our society, and we all need to do a better job of confronting it in our city, in our neighborhoods, in ourselves, and in our schools. Our children are watching and paying attention. They see the news. They see the videos. Educators have a duty to address it. We cannot continue to turn a blind eye. Social tolerance will never be part of the fabric of society until we bring children up in a tolerant environment. No child is born racist, but the system can make them so. Educating everyone the right way, including <coughs> men and women, could make the world a difference. What those of us in the white community need to recognize is that simply removing our knee from the neck of the black community isn't enough. We must extend a hand and a warm embrace of equity, that we must assure and provide equitable access to education and economic opportunity. There is a push to fight the equity policy headed by Victoria Manning in a page that shares her screenshots, which she likely runs, called Take Back Virginia Beach School Board. It's filled with racist, vile posts and comments. It shows the exact reason why an equity policy is needed. How will black and brown students ever succeed if the people making policies and educating them have such racial bias? Recently, the topic of SROs was on the news and I asked my biracial daughter, who's now a sophomore, what type of interaction she's had with SROs. She told me she was referred to the SRO in middle school for having an attitude. You may find it alarming that something as simple as an attitude warrants getting law enforcement involved, especially since the teacher had never even mentioned any behavioral issues. But it's what she said after that struck me. She said it's what she does to all the black kids, mom. My daughter brushed this incident off like it was normal because her teacher had a racial bias. Statistics do not lie that black students are disciplined at a higher rate than their white peers. Last month, I emailed the school board about a culturally insensitive activity held during PE class at some of the Virginia Beach elementary schools. Children pretended to be slaves while participating in an obstacle course representing the Underground Railroad. The experiences varied from school to school. Some st students reported lights off, sounds of dogs barking and gunshots playing. Sometimes the game continued in some cases for weeks as children kept being called slaves on the, on, at, at recess. As students got older, they looked black back and were disgusted to know that they had took part and some were hurt at just how insensitive the activity was. I was connected to Dr. Parrott, the Director of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion at Virginia Beach City Public Schools, who assured me this wouldn't happen moving forward and that staff would be told how insensitive the activity was. While well intended, this example just highlights the need for mandatory training. I urge you to vote to pass the equity policy with mandatory training for all staff. I appreciate Dr. Parrott's expertise and look forward to seeing more of what she has to offer the school district. I do not see this as a blank check, as some have said. I see this as a step in the right direction to make sure our schools are safe and inclusive for students and teachers. Racism is perpetuated by the people who refuse to learn or acknowledge it. We are watching how you vote tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kelly Walker. Please unmute. Welcome. Good evening, Chairwoman Rye, Vice Chairwoman Melnick, Superintendent Spence, and members of the school board. My name is Kelly Walker, and I serve as the president of the Virginia Beach Education Association. I would like to speak tonight on the scheduling and transportation update, as well as the equity policy. But first, I would like to thank the school board for placing elements of the reopening plan on the formal agenda tonight. It is so important that the school board continue to hear from the community as the pandemic is not over. 
As our school division continues to monitor the coronavirus and its impact, providing an opportunity for the public to comment to stakeholders as important decisions are made, is critical to the transparency of the division on important issues and fosters the communication process. It is also important that the public have the opportunity to speak to formal agenda items before the board begins its formal meetings. Otherwise, folks will not have the opportunity to give their viewpoints before the board debates the issue. I strongly urge the school board moving forward to give all who wish to address the body an, import, an opportunity to speak to important topics listed on the formal agenda before the school board debates them. Now on to my remarks. Understanding the complexities involved with scheduling both face-to-face -face and online learning in 86 very different school cultures it is expected that there are and will continue to be challenges balancing staff and student needs. Again, the VBA is concerned that cuts to the budget and a lack of sufficient staff will continue to hinder our ability to safely return to a face-to-face -face learning environment. It is critical that in order to mitigate safely while in a face-to-face -face learning environment, that class size remains small. We did not have the resources to provide small class size before the pandemic, and we do not have the resources now. We simply do not have the teachers and staff. We are stretched to the limit and therefore more is being asked of our employees. I wrote my remarks before Dr. Robinson gave his recommendation to opening to face-to-face -face instruction October 6. I still believe my remarks are relevant to this discussion. To further illustrate the challenges this was scheduling in this environment, on Friday, teachers were asked to volunteer to teach both face-to-face -face and online simultaneously. Teachers had to decide by Tuesday, September 8 at 4 p.m. A stipend of only $75 for one to three weeks was offered. Furthermore, this offer on the Friday before the first day of school places stressful burden on all teachers. As teachers contemplated teaching face-to-face -face and online at the same time, they wondered what impact that would have on their workload and to the students in their classes. Many thought, what if students were left without a teacher because I did not agree to do both? Teachers care very deeply for their students and many are willing to sacrifice for the well-being of their students. Many teachers agonized over the weekend as to what to do. Regardless of the pandemic, this is just not the right thing to do to the teachers on the weekend before school starts. Teachers had enough to worry about on the first day of school without having to worry about another increase to their workload or what would happen to their students. The bottom line is this, the fact that the division has a need for teachers to teach both face-to-face -face and online at the same time translates to not enough resources, in this case staff, to accommodate the hybrid plan. Were there other options presented to fill this need? That answer was presented in the workshop by pushing off the pivot to face-to-face -to, -face to October 6th. Regardless of when we do pivot to face-to-face, -to -face, the VBA will continue to advocate for an expanded sick leave bank for employees that employees do not have to go to work sick. I don't have enough time to address the equity policy. I just would like to say that the Virginia Education Association since 1967 has pushed for racial justice because it's committed to the mission values and promises we made to the members of the Virginia Teachers Association to advocate for educational equity in Virginia. We are committed to improving our students and members' lives as well as improving our communities. We will develop and implement a racial justice plan that engages time. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Our next speaker is Shauna O'Galvin. Please unmute. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Um, I'm speaking to support the proposed equity policy and admonish Ms. Manning's public objection of it posted on her website and shared on social media. In her criticism of the policy, Ms. Manning cites various opinion articles from clearly biased political websites that are not based in fact or data, but ones written by non-experts in the subject of educational equity who are only proficient at conservative opinion and rumination, ones that put the phrase white privilege in quotation marks as if it's a term to be mocked. It's appalling that Ms. Manning relies on these biased resources to argue against a policy intended to provide training and resources meant to equip every student to reach their goal of graduating from Virginia Beach City Public Schools without having systemic racism and blaring inequity being an obstacle to that goal. Be BIPOC, that is Black, Brown, Indigenous, and people of color. 
be BIPOC individuals are here as free labor having to explain the ramifications of spending a lifetime in a school system, frankly created by white people. And here we are, people of color telling you what is wrong with the system. And people like you, Ms. Manning, you still stand in the way. That is white privilege, point blank. It is a privilege to educate yourself about racism instead of experiencing it. Ms. Manning also denounces the idea of abolitionist teaching by quoting a more reputable article published by the Association for Supervision and Curriculum Development, in which Professor Bettina L. Love explains how abolitionist teaching comes from a critical perspective that which calls out racist, homophobic, and Islamophobic behaviors through expression of one's First Amendment rights. Upon further reading Ms. Love's description of abolitionist teaching, it also includes, quote, no police, no dogs, no metal detectors. Children walk into beautiful, bright buildings that look like someone is ready to love them in that space. There would be as many therapists and healers and counselors as teachers, because what we don't talk about is the generational and everyday trauma, regardless of race and nationality, that children are dealing with. We wouldn't suspend kids. Teachers would skill, be skillful in their content, and in Asian American Pacific Islander, Latinx, Native American and African American culture. Teachers would live in the school's community and be paid more than what they're paid now. We'd be recruiting kids to be teachers and mentoring them through high school and into college and paying for their schooling." End quote. Now, honestly, that sounds like an educational environment in which we should be striving. Ms. Manning also uh, mentions opposition to defunding our police as part of her criticism of this policy, which is confounding because this phrase actually means reallocating taxpayer dollars to community resources like education, resources, housing, health care, social services, youth services, all resources that are meant to supplement police department by way of decriminalization of mental illness, public safety, and overall delinquency and crime reduction within the youth population, which disproportionately affects minority communities. In a time when the school budget has just been decimated by another $95 million, leaving teachers without meaningful raises yet again, why are you against initiatives intended to benefit the overall community? The fact that we are even here debating this very subject just goes to show how much training and education our leaders need to go through to even understand the surface of anti-racism and genuine diversity and inclusion and educational equity. My two children that attend BBCPS are, are multicultural and their schools reflect a very ethnically, physically, mentally, religious and socioeconomically diverse community. It's about to be Thank you. Our next speaker is Caitlin Lively. Please unmute. Welcome. Welcome. Hi. Um, I am so glad to see the school board cares about and is working to make a more equitable environment for all teachers and students. We all agree this issue is important and we all want our children to see community members that value the input of others, no matter the color of their skin, their sexual orientation or religious beliefs. Our goal is the same, but I have reservations about bias training based in critical race theory. It is important to note that the current conversations about race is different. Things have changed, but we are still using the same language to describe different things. The biggest difference is the definition of racism. The dictionary definition that we all grew up with is prejudice, discrimination, and antagonism directed against someone of a different race based on the belief that one's own race is superior. Whereas the critical race theory definition of racism is complicated. Racism is the normal soci way society does business according to critical race theory and only visible to those who experience it or who are trained to see it. The simple act of smiling at another person could be analyzed to find the hidden racism baked into the interaction. The question becomes how racism was present in the situation, not if it was present. Everything is viewed through the lens of race with one group being told they hold supremacy and the other being told they are powerless. This definition classifies people exclusively by skin tone and leaves no room for those, for those people to ever be redeemed from the power status of their birth. To claim you are not racist is a form of denial, the very heartbeat of racism, according to Ibram Kendi, author of How to Be Anti-Racist. You are either racist or anti-racist, and the work is never finished. 
These ideas and teachings foster division, conflict, and resentment. It reduces every interaction into a power struggle that must be overcome by using loaded words, inflammatory language, and shame. Then, when people voice their thoughts and feelings concerning this definition and method, they are labeled as fragile. This does not provide the neutral ground needed to have important conversations about an equitable working or learning environment. Free speech, non-judgmental environments, and respectful open dialogue allows us to challenge biases and preconceived notions together. Let us listen and discuss, not shame and blame each other. I'm afraid this new equity plan would put too much power into the hands of the superintendent. This is too important of a topic to both teachers and students that I think a bigger oversight is needed. Let both the teachers and families have a say in which programs become mandatory. We all have a stake in this fight. Our goals are the same, but we need to make sure we do it the right way. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker is Valika Gatling. Please unmute. Welcome. Hello, can you hear me? Loud and clear, welcome. Thank you so much. Good evening, Chairwoman Rye, Vice Chair uh, Melnick and school board members and Dr. Spence. As stated, my name is Valika Gatling. This evening, my comments will be made in support of the equity policy. I'm speaking as a former employee and student of Virginia Beach City Public Schools and a member of the faith-based community as the first lady at Ebenezer Baptist Church here in Virginia Beach. Approving this policy would be a positive step in recognizing the need for a true cultural shift in Virginia Beach City Public Schools and the community. To move towards racial equity, we must prioritize humanity. People need the ability to work, learn, and live with the dignity of having their histories acknowledged and their life experiences valued and not just seen as numbers in a chart. When Black students and staff are viewed as numbers in a chart, we fail to pay attention to intent versus impact in our conversations, curriculum, and capacity building. I have heard people in our school division attempt to deflect criticism about their oppressive language or actions by making the conversation about their intent. I have heard and seen staff members ignoring the needs of students and staff by using oppressive language or actions by making the conversation about their intent. Let me provide you with a few examples of words and actions that have been shared with me by black staff members that were impactful, but painted as not intentional. A principal asking, would you mind covering basketball games this year? I understand black people like basketball. A well-dressed black female walks in the building and approaches a security desk and is asked, are you here to interview for the custodial position? A question, why do we have so few black males who have risen from the ranks of teacher to administrator, yet we have one of the most robust professional learning departments in the region? Now things that happen to me, being told that challenging the inequities of the selection process of gifted programs would lead to career suicide, being bullied by a senior elementary principal during a league meeting. When, when I reported it, I was told I was wearing my feelings on my sleeve and perhaps I didn't understand her perspective because I had not been a principal. I served as a principal in two school divisions prior to coming to Virginia Beach City Public Schools. What you say, not and, and lastly, not afforded an opportunity to have a face-to-face -face exit interview when requested. What you say and do to people has impact. Maya Angelou said, people may forget what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. Understanding how to modify and adjust your behaviors to work, learn, and live with others who have varying cultural experiences that you do, then you do will help you realize your intent versus impact. Cultural competence, the training that's mentioned in the policy, is understanding how to modify and adjust your behaviors to work, learn, and live with others who have varying cultural experiences than you do. It's providing an opportunity for Black students and staff members to work, live, and work with the dignity of having their histories acknowledged and their life experiences valued and not just seen as numbers in charts. This equity, equity policy is needed so that we can address the intent versus impact in our conversations, curriculum, and how we build capacity. It's time to treat the system, not the symptom. 
Policies address systems. Policies demonstrate advocacy. Policies demonstrate a commitment to values. This policy will demonstrate your commitment to further operationalize your mission, values, and strategic plan. Will it be magical and cause everyone to monitor their actions and words and generalize their culturally responsive skills across all settings? No, but it's a start. And so I would, um, I hope that you would vote yes for this equity policy. That is time. Okay, thank you. Our next speaker is Megan Rafferty. Please unmute. As an educator, a mother, and a member of the Virginia Beach community, school safety is one of my most important priorities. Physical safety has been at the top of the agenda and first in every conversation about the reopening of schools for months, but just behind physical safety is the importance of psychological safety. I believe that an equity policy is imperative for the psychological safety of our students, their families, and all Virginia Beach City Public Schools employees. In order for children to feel psychologically safe, they must be cared for by a teacher that feels safe, both physically and psychologically. Students know what it feels like to learn in a classroom where every child is respected and cared for. Teachers who lead these kinds of classrooms work hard to make sure the students in their classroom are safe, but they also research and advocate for systemic changes that ensure every child in the division is treated with dignity and respect. When teachers fully commit to equity, they're taking a risk. They're inviting controversy and difficult conversation. They're opening their hearts and minds and exposing their vulnerability. They're investing their emotional energy and challenging their personal beliefs. If Virginia Beach City Public Schools is fully committed to systemic equity, they must also be fully committed to protecting and supporting the teachers who devote their mind, body, and spirit to the fight for equity. Please support the Virginia Beach City Public Schools equity policy. Please support the commitment to equitable practices for our students and their families, our systems, and our policies. Please also support the teachers who are committed to social justice for themselves as black and brown educators and for the children they fight for. If the Virginia Beach School Board truly believes in the development of the capacity for cultural competence, they will explicitly commit to the defense of teachers who strive for equity out loud and every day. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sherelle Milo. Please unmute. Welcome. Good evening. First, I want to thank the members of the school board, Dr. Spence and the school administration for all their hard work. I also want to thank all the speakers who have bravely shared their very raw and personal experiences encountering racism and bias in the school system. I'm a Virginia Beach City's public schools teacher and implicit bias is a topic near and dear to my heart. I grew up in Virginia Beach and attended Virginia Beach City Public Schools from kindergarten through 12th grade. Despite the diverse demographics of Virginia Beach, oftentimes I was the only black student in my advanced honors, AP, and gifted classes. This is due in part to the inequities in the methods used to select honors and gifted and talented students. My mom had to beg to get me tested for gifted despite the fact that I exhibited gifted traits early on. I felt alone as a student because I didn't see the other students who looked like me. The research on implicit bias is clear. We now know that students of color have systemic barriers that can prevent them from reaching their full potential. I want to stop you here and point out that implicit bias is not synonymous with racism. In fact, implicit bias is just our subconscious associations and snap judgments that do not always align with our explicit beliefs and social mores. The nature in which students of color from, um, from ODS and advanced classes like, oh, excuse me, the nature in which students are selected for special programs leads to the exclusion of students of color from ODS, advanced classes like AP and honors and academies because of these subconscious associations. Again, to clarify, I am not saying that students are excluded from these programs because any of the teachers in Virginia Beach are inherently racist. History shows us that school institutions like grades, tracking and special programs were first built to exclude the poor and then those same methods were used to exclude students of color once they were allowed to join the school system. I am simply pointing out that the educational system was built on a premise of exclusion. So we must do everything in our power within the school division to com combat these systemic issues. The only way to do that is to vote in favor of the equity policy that was so thoughtfully developed. An equity policy that helps ensure that the success of all students within the division will ensure that we are truly putting students first, seeking growth, being open to change, doing great work together and valuing differences. I want to extend a special thank you to Dr. Parrott for her efforts. 
Thank you all for your time. Our next speaker is Connor Epley. Please unmute. Good evening, wow. members of the school board. Oh, thank you. Good evening, members of the school board. My name is Connor Epley, and I'm addressing you today to urge you to adopt the proposed educational equity policy. The proposed policy will improve the lives of minority students, help foster a welcoming, inclusive environment in our schools, and give students who have barriers to learning a better chance at academic success. Tonight, I wanted to share my experiences as a student so you know what is happening in our schools and why the policy you are voting on tonight matters. I can say with confidence as a recent graduate of our schools that for far too long, students who are in a minority group have faced and continue to face barriers to their education. Students of color, students who practice a different religion, students who identify as LGBTQ+, students who just simply come from diverse backgrounds face discrimination in our schools that directly impacts their access to education. At my school, a day would not go by where I didn't hear racial slurs such as the N-word, homophobic slurs and comments such as the F-word or that's so gay, or offensive comments towards Spanish-speaking students such as mocking their language, joking about them being in a gang, and even telling Spanish-speaking students to stop speaking Spanish and speak English. And that's me leaving a lot of discriminatory behavior out. Now, hearing these things and seeing this behavior come from students was infuriating. However, what was even more frustrating was that when teachers heard and saw this behavior, most of them did not do anything about it. And even if they did, it was often not enough to prevent the same thing from happening in the future. Most of the students who got what was essentially a slap on the wrist laughed and joked about it after the fact. Being a member of the LGBTQ plus community, I, wanted, I want to speak about how discriminatory behavior impacts us. LGBTQ plus youth are often targeted for their sexual orientation and or gender identity. We regularly are subjected to various forms of discrimination. There are so many LGBTQ plus youth that are still coming to terms with who they are and learning to accept themselves, learning that there's nothing wrong with who they are. So for these students hearing degrading language and comments about who they are, being subjected to behavior that is designed to humiliate them for being different is detrimental and frankly could contribute to a student self-harming and trying to take their own life. According to the Trevor Project, a nonprofit that focuses on suicide prevention efforts among LGBTQ plus youth, they say each episode of LGBT victimization, such as physical or verbal harassment or abuse, increases the likelihood of self-harming behavior by 2.5 times on average. Let's be perfectly clear. We need to do something. Now, and listening to some of the speakers tonight, I heard someone essentially say, we have more important issues to deal with right now. So I wanna ask, when is it important to deal with? Because it clearly wasn't important so when some of my friends were told, this is America, speak English. It wasn't time when I had to walk an LGBTQ classmate LGBTQ plus classmate to student services who was in tears after being harassed by classmates relentlessly. It wasn't time when I heard they only won because they had N-words on their team in the locker room following gym class. So again, I ask, why is it still not the time to address this? I wanted to share all of this with you because I have faith that once you hear what is going on in our schools, you will take the appropriate action to rectify the problem such as approving the educational equity policy tonight. While it is impossible to prevent every case of bullying and discrimination, there are things we as a community can and should do to prevent it. Here, we have a prime example of something you as elected officials can do. Thank you so much for your time. Our next speaker is Chevette Jeffries. Please unmute. Hi, thank you. My name is Chevette Williams Jeffries. I am a military spouse, a mother of four, but three children whom are in the Virginia Beach public school system. I am a member of the D9 or Historical Black Fraternities and Sororities. I am talking as a teacher as well as a parent. I am speaking in, in support of the Equity Educational Act. I am also speaking as part of being as a military spouse. This policy will ensure that all public schools in Virginia Beach will focus and force two main factors that goes into educational equity, fairness and inclusion. 
one's personal condition should not interfere with one's academic success. It should be a level playing field for all students. And just to give you an example of an uneven playing field, this is what happened to my child today while this is only the second day of school. I sent a message to her teacher assistant to let her know that she has qualified for an IEP. We had the meeting in July of this year and it was supposed to be put in place for the beginning of this school year. But for some odd reason, the social worker never wrote the IEP up. So this is the conversation we had today. Just letting you know that the teacher, Ms. Williams, gave multiple steps to my child and she's lost and still stuck on the first step. This is her reply. We will have visuals and written directions for her. Probably a checklist of steps for multiple steps assigned when we or we are still in the process of getting scheduled things in place. Her IEP will be put in place once the meeting occurs on Monday. I said, if I understand you correctly, we will have to wait until her IEP is put in place before she can receive visual and written directions. Please correct me if I am wrong. I'm trying to understand. The response I got is she will be guaranteed visuals and once it's in place, I will work on getting things set up before then. If this doesn't ask for educational equity, I don't know what does. This policy will ensure that not only will my child, but other children who are, who are on an IEP will be guaranteed a successful year for an education. As I conclude my statement, with this policy being in place, we will help build an educational environment that is, in, that is all about empowering students, making sure that all students have what they need to be, succeed, to be successful in the classroom and beyond. Thank you. Thank you. The next listed speaker, Chastity Browning, is not online, so we will go to Danielle Coughlin. Please unmute. Welcome. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Loud and clear. Wonderful. So as you guys know, my name is Danielle Coughlin. I'm grateful to be speaking to you again tonight. Tonight, I'm advocating for the equity policy. I just want to illustrate how important this was for me in my career as an educator. So I grew up in Chesapeake, Virginia. I went to Hickory High School. I was a member of the 4-H club. I also attended a graduate, an undergraduate program and a graduate and a graduate program that lacked diversity. So when I got my first teaching job at Bayside Elementary School, as well intentioned as I was, I was ill-prepared and unequipped to meet the needs of my students. There was so much, so, so much that I did not know and so much that I needed to unpack within myself to be the kind of teacher that my students in my community needed me to be. I was very fortunate early in my career to participate in the Courageous Conversation workshops facilitated by Dr. Parrott. I cannot understand why certain school board members are trying to make this seem like a scary thing for teachers to have access to this training. It completely changed my practice. It changed my students' achievement. It changed the way that we functioned in our school. And now that I'm in an instructional coach role, I'm seeing how these practices with equity, these practices with cultural responsiveness, how it can change an entire school dynamic, how the students interact with one another and how they look at their own learning. It is incredibly powerful and our students deserve this opportunity. Every child in our division deserves for their teacher to be prepared with an understanding of equity and culturally responsive practices. Every child deserves the resources that they need for an equitable access to education and personal empowerment. To deny the inequity within our society and our system of education would be to choose blindness. For what? Why are you doing this if not for political gain? Children would lose. That should be what's important here. That's the moral imperative is to do what is right for children. So, if you believe in doing what is right for children, please vote in favor of the equity policy. A vote against it would be a vote against the structures and supports that our students need and deserve. 
Thank you. Okay. Our next speaker is Suzanne Saltisak. Please unmute. Welcome. Hello, good evening. Um, I come before you tonight to ask you to please support and pass the equity policy that has been proposed. One of the things that I love about Virginia Beach schools is the diversity of backgrounds, cultures, and races that are in our school system. While we as a district have been well-intentioned in our policies and practice, we need the training and assessment this equity proposal provides. For example, just this past year, you as a board have addressed reconfiguring the school calendar after not realizing the impact of beginning school on a Jewish holy day. I've talked with teachers who didn't know that some of their Muslim students might be fasting during Ramadan and to be aware of that during PE or lunch. Now you might say that's because of a lack of knowledge. That makes it seem really easy, but as you saw with the calendar, the unintended consequences of what you didn't know when making that decision could have impacted many in different ways. When we make decisions like that out of a lack of knowledge of the impact, we are superimposing our own experiences um, onto a situation. And we don't even reach out to ask because so often we don't realize the importance of that experience. So what is it that our schools are missing because of what you don't know? What could our teachers miss because of what they don't know? What could our policies impact because of what we assume that we know? Another issue that you've addressed this year has been the lack of representation at ODS. We heard that it had been identified as an issue earlier. And as a remedy, the schools created a blind application process, but never reassessed it until this year when it appeared that the issue not only didn't improve, but in some ways worsened with that remedy. On completion of an analysis, it seems that the issue was not necessarily where we attempted to address it, and it might actually lie more within recruitment. We had the best of intentions, but without actively reaching out to understand and discuss these issues, we would keep missing the mark and it would impact our students. Even further, I, it hasn't been assessed from the best I can tell at the academies. We don't need this policy because one race is bad or to blame. We need it because we must acknowledge that our society has been shaped by race and culture. And that defines the experiences that our teachers, our students, our leadership and our community has. How many of our teachers and our parents graduated from school before schools were even integrated and never had the opportunity to go to school with children who looked different than them? How many of our board members did? With the calendar, you made statements about what you didn't know and had the ability to go back and fix that mistake caused by the lack of knowledge when the community came in to let you know. You had students and parents, you have students and parents of color letting you know that some of the decisions that you have made based upon your knowledge and experience have the same kind of negative impact. You've had, you've heard them tonight. Will you listen? There is research and information to substantiate what you have heard tonight. There are trainings that help our teachers to not make those same kind of mistakes or assessments, not to make them on a grander scale. Having this policy, these assessments, this training will help us to have these conversations and to ensure that lack of knowledge about the experience of others' culture and experience is not a barrier to the education of our students and to the education of our community. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Annie Speckhart. Please unmute. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Uh, good evening, school board members. Uh, thank you for taking the time to uh, listen to us. Um, I do not have a set of notes. I was not going to speak today. I would love to have been in person, uh, but I could not make it. Uh, I actually had surgery today, but it was so important for me to talk about this subject that I had to get on Zoom. Um, first, let me say um, I'm very disheartened by what happened in the beginning of the meeting. For 30 minutes, you all went on to go on and on about somebody not wearing a mask when everybody was separated big time. I don't understand that logic. It makes zero sense to me. Um, are we all not using the same touch screens at the grocery store? Did you all not hold the same door handle walking into the building to spend 30 minutes? And it is now what, nine o'clock, 930 on that. And then to have Mrs. Hughes leave the building, that is horrendous. I am disgusted by that. 
Um, so that's my first topic. I had to get that off my uh, my um, my heart. But I am voting against the equity policy because I'm wondering as a parent and a single mom, why now? Is this political? Are we really a racist people? I don't know. I'm not black. But you know what? Do you all know that 13% of blacks make up the vote? So explain to me how Obama got uh, voted in not once, but twice by the remainder of the population. What is that, 87%? I actually voted for him once, once. But yet we're teaching our kids that you are discriminated against and you are racist. Instead of saying, you know what guys, a black man got voted, thank God. Like, thank you God, we are not teaching that. Why aren't we teaching love everybody? This is insane. You know, racism um, exists in our world everywhere. I grew up very poor. Yes, I'm a white girl with blonde hair. I've been called Karen. I've been called all kinds of things, but I grew up poor and I was teased in school. I had psoriasis all over my body. So I was teased by kids. I was teased because I was poor. I was teased because I weighed 65 pounds. I was called a slut even though I was a virgin. People tease and say stupid stuff about people all the time. We need to teach something else in school, not just blacks. It's not just a black thing. It is a hate thing. We have a heart problem in this country, not a racial problem. I'm sure it exists, but it exists on both sides. And let me tell you my story. A few years ago, my son, who was a straight A student, has been on the principal's list his whole school career, was called into the principal's office. It was the last day of school and there was a picture um, in the yearbook of him doing the neck flicking signal. Well, one parent called in and said, that's a racial signal, uh, meaning white power. So they didn't, we, we had to go and research it and that has been debunked by the ACLU. Yet my son got called into the office, a straight A student, a hard worker, and was told that he was racist. So how do you think as a parent, Balancing checkbooks. Good credit. I'm contemplating taking my son out of school. Thank God he only has two more years left in the school district. Racism goes both ways. Do you think this, this thing you're going to teach to make white kids feel like they're less of a person is going to change anything? It's not. It starts at home and it starts with God. So bring God back in our schools. Ms. Beckhart, that is telling. Our next speaker is Sanya Nicole Bagley. Please unmute. Welcome. Hello. Hi. My name is actually Sanaya. I want to take this time and address the lady before me who had the nerve to say something about racism. It goes both ways. If we learn anything in school, if your son learned anything in school, you would know that racism started with African Americans and us working on its plantations in the United States of America. So first, I want to take the four minutes of my time given to address adults on the school board who wasted 30 minutes of my time and other parents and students who had to wait online or outside humidity and rain for you grown men and women to argue about wearing masks. I want to say wholeheartedly and clearly that those of you on the school board that are against wearing masks and turn it into a political, a political issue are the exact reason why I am at home behind a computer for my senior year, my last year of high school. You are the reason why a child could not enter the building on their first day of kindergarten, middle school and high school. Since I am on the topic of COVID and, COVID and masks, did you know that black and Latinos have been affected most by the coronavirus and are more immune to it than whites. Once again, white privilege never fails, but yet minorities suffer to have their lives protected, and most importantly, their health not protected. So what does that say to those who are ignorant and selfish that wish not to wear a mask? It means that to you, my health does not matter. Black and minority lives do not matter, and my life will not matter to you regardless. Now on to equity. I am for it. I'm going to start with the racism towards the Black Student Union at Kempsville High School with my friend Carrington, who was here earlier, who's the president, and I serve on the executive board with her. When we started this program in 2019, we started the first Black Student Union in the Virginia Beach City Public Schools. When we started this program and before we had our first meeting, we, we had the time and opportunity to go on the news and tell them about our program. With that, there were death threats 
thrown to us saying that we were racist and that we were communist. There were pages made by students at our school who had the KKK in a fire in their um, profile picture saying that white lives matter. And I want to shout out to the police officer who carries an informed me in the corner who failed to make eye, con with, eye contact with her. Is her skin color still a weapon to you? Maybe Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and Jacob Blake can answer that for me. Next, history. We learned history in school, but tell me why not once I've heard the name John Lewis. We talk about Rosa Parks, how she didn't give up her seat. MLK, we have a day for him, but what about John Lewis? He just died a few months ago and I never heard his name until then. Confederate monument, still an issue going on in society. We learned about the Civil War years ago and it's still the Confederate monuments that shine light in my face that are very racist. Next to Breonna Taylor and women who are still overlooked. No officers have been arrested for the death of Breonna Taylor and I wanna be sent back into a school with officers who have guns on them and I'm scared of my life. What if I fall asleep, will they shoot me too? Moving on, Black Lives Matter, justice for Breonna Taylor, justice for Jacob Blake and wear the mask. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Donna Hamid. Please unmute. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Donna Hamid, and I'm with the Virginia Beach Council PTA and also the Virginia PTA Advocacy Committee. And I'm speaking about advancing equity and diversity. The Virginia Beach, or the Virginia PTA, state PTA, has long standing commitments to the principles of anti-discrimination and anti-racism and we value and appreciate the diversity which enriches and strengthens the structure of our society within our state and nation. Virginia PTA urges its members of all levels to monitor, support, and advocate for programs and policies that embrace diversity and inclusivity and strengthens and to work to eliminate structural inequities that eliminate or limit equitable learning opportunities. Um, for student achievement, Virginia PTA supports programs that reduce student academic achievement gaps and that expand opportunities for minority students. Staff training, Virginia PTA supports educators, supports staff and administrative staff participating in ongoing <coughs> mandatory training and professional development programs that seek to recognize students' strengths and skills and reinforce appreciation for cultural differences for the purpose of reducing unconscious bias. Workforce diversity, Virginia PTA supports expanded teacher recruitment and mentoring programs that seek to promote diversity of educators and staff. Curriculum review and media, Virginia PTA urges Virginia Board of Education and local school boards to review history textbooks and curriculum at every grade level to eliminate language, behavior, or retelling of events that is stereotypical, demeaning, exclusionary, or judgmental, and instead embrace cultural contests with appreciation and celebration of cultures and their contributions to our society. Library Media Review, Virginia PTA encourages local school divisions to undertake a review of the reading materials in school libraries to ensure all books reinforce the message that diverse interests and backgrounds make our country special and strong. Discipline and, <clears throat> excuse me, dis proportionality. Virginia PTA supports school discipline practices that seek to address a student's situational and behavior motivation and prevent future disciplinary incidents in a positive way that keeps children in school and learning over exclusionary discipline policies such as suspension and expulsion. School facilities and mascots. Virginia PTA supports renaming school facilities and mascots that are based on Confederate leaders, culturally intensive depictions of indigenous people, images, and that fails to respect, honor, and celebrate the diversity of our school communities. Translation and access. Virginia PTA encourages school divisions to provide translation of student performance documents and school communications to foster transparency and parent participation and be mindful that not every family has access to technology to support electronic communication or receipt of student data. Data transparency. The Virginia PTA urges the Virginia Board of Education to include information about teacher ethnicity and racial diversity on the school quality profile for each school and indicate languages spoken by, excuse me, languages spoken by staff and whether or not teachers and building staff have completed 
cultural sensitivity training equity committees. Virginia PTA supports the creation of equity and cultural responsiveness committees and chief equity officers within each school division to support implement, excuse me, implementation of culturally responsive practices across the school division. All right, thank you. Thank you. you can our next speaker, our next speaker is Lisa Turner. Please unmute. Welcome. 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 Hello, and thank you all. Um, it's good to be with you. Um, thank you very much to all of you for your service to our city and to our students and to our institution here. Um, like I said, my name is Lisa Turner. I'm a homeowner, a taxpayer. And I don't have any children, but I very much appreciate the work that you all do to be forward leaning. Um, I've never spoken in all the time I've lived in this community on any policy that you all have taken on and are considering. I consider this particular equity, um, educational e equity policy to be one of the most important things uh, that we can do as an investment, not only in our teachers and the people that support them, but also our students and the youth that are going through our school system today. Um, I take a lot of pride in the fact that I moved back to Virginia Beach and I love to say to people that we have really great schools here. And um, it's one of the things that I think uh, you all have done an excellent job in being forward thinking and in these uncertain times, we really need strong leaders on diversity and equity issues. And I understand with this policy that equity doesn't equal equality, and that's okay because there's only so much that policies can do for students and youth. But I wanna thank you for your leadership and I appreciate your support in advance of tonight's vote on this policy. Thanks so much. Um, Brian Owens spoke earlier in person, so our next speaker is Harry Grabber. Please unmute. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Harry Graber, and I am a uh, retired citizen of Virginia Beach. And thank you for all your hard work on behalf of the students and teachers in the educational system of Virginia Beach. I would like to speak in support of the equity program with certain uh, qualifications that I will speak to a bit later on. First of all, I uh, remain astounded that the issue of racism and uh, the barriers that uh, racism and uh, religious discrimination and all the other factors that people have been discriminated against does not re does not remain an incontrovertible fact in this day and age. And I don't know what we need to do to prove that that has been an historic and continuing fact in the lives of people who are, in fact, who are impacted by that discrimination. That said, I also think that the uh, comments that have been made that talk about the uh, critical race theory that is being uh, adopted by this test, by this uh, Department of Education as being somehow laden with uh, all sorts of uh, reverse racism, to use an old term, is I think nonsensical. I think people have been quoting white fragility, people have been quoting how to be an anti-racist and saying that the primary charge of those books are to make white people feel bad. And that could be nothing further from the truth. I think the charge of those books are to look how racism has contaminated the inner lives of all people have, who have lived in a society that has been uh, contaminated by that kind of practice for the last 400 years. And we've obviously, the kids have, and the teachers have only lived in that society for the last maybe 18, to 50 years. And to think that your inner and professional life has not been contaminated by that is closing your mind and closing yourself off to the obvious. 
So I think as a professional, all teachers should welcome, if they have any professional self-respect, welcome the opportunity to uh, separate themselves from that kind of contamination and be able to heighten themselves as a professional to be the best kind of professional they can be to their students. I think children and parents of children should provide the best kind of environment possible, which would be a racist free environment so their children can grow up to be the best citizens possible and compete in a society that will be filled with people of color because the people of color are not gonna be going backwards. They're gonna be seizing the day and they're gonna be moving in a society that, and they're going to compete. They're not going to be sitting back anymore. And I just want to quote, people have been talking about, well, we need to postpone it. COVID is, we need to pay attention to COVID and all the things that are challenging our school system. I would just quote a uh, report by McKinsey and company that did a longitudinal study on corporations uh, in about six different countries, including the United Kingdom and the United States. And they said the companies that practice diversity show greater profitability than, than companies of the same kind that don't, that don't practice diversity and inclusion. So the lesson to be learned is that diversity wins and they recommend not to use COVID as an excuse to short change on diversity. One of the other things I want to say is that this school system has to compete. Time's up, sir, but please. If you so choose, thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Amelia Ross Hammond. Welcome. Chairwoman. Carolyn Rye, Vice Chair, and members of the school board, Superintendent Spence, administrators, teachers, and visitors, good evening. My name is Dr. Amelia Ross Hammond, former councilwoman, founder and chairman of the Virginia African American Culture Center, and today representing the African American Roundtable. I'm a retired professor emeritus from Norfolk State University, and as a former music educator, have taught at every level for over 40 years, nationally and internationally. Thanks for allowing me to add my voice and amplify the importance of an equity policy for our school system. School cultures that promote equity, respect, and a sense of belonging among all of our students are more effective in keeping their schools proactive and safe against explicit, implicit, and unconscious biases because an equity policy has been put in place. An equitable education system helps all students develop the knowledge and skills they need to be engaged and become productive members of society. More importantly, an equitable start will lead to better economic and social outcome for every student in our Virginia Beach school system. Systemic and historic barriers for many children have been the norm rather than the exception. We cannot positively sustain changes without a policy in place as a reference point. This helps us to address the complex forces that affect our children and how they learn. Such forces have already been documented in this proposed equity study and policy. We must move forward to implement these policies by taking actions. The difference between equality in education and equity in education is supple yet significant. Where equality aims for equal treatment of all students with, with access to similar resources, equity strives for giving each student the resources they need to compete on equal footing. An equity policy will address the critical economic, social, and great, uh, global issues that are invariably connected to equity in our learners. Equity is vital to improving school readiness and to creating a fair start for every learner. Only when participants in education experience embrace equity as a core value and use it to shape policy and practices will we see 
meaningful progress for all. These policies are important because they help a school establish rules and procedures and create standards of quality for learning and safety, as well as expectation and quant accountability. Without these, schools would lack the structure and function necessary to provide the education needs of our students. I truly believe that every student, faculty, staff, and family deserves an equity policy that will provide them the structural village that surrounds each student in Virginia Beach with the confidence to stand shoulder to shoulder with their peers. Again, I thank the Equity Council and the superintendent for preparing this comprehensive policy, which addresses all race, creed, and color that help to remove these barriers in a strategic manner. Michael Jordan said, some people want it to happen, some wish it would happen, and others make it happen. Booker T. Washington said, if you want to lift yourself up, lift someone else up. This time, it's not about us. It's about lifting our future generations up. Let's make it happen, Virginia Beach. Thank you. Thank you. That was our last online speaker for agenda items. Thank you, Madam Clerk. That brings us to agenda item eight, approval of the minutes, the August 25th, 2020 regular school minutes, a uh, meeting, excuse me. <laughs> Any modifications? A motion by Mr. Edwards, a second, Mrs. Second. I'm sorry, Mrs. Melnick, I was tongue tied. <laughs> uh, all those in favor, uh, please raise your hands. Ms. Manning, how do you vote? Uh, I just raised my hand. Oh, thank you. Madam Chair, uh, Madam Chair, it's a unanimous vote, including uh, Ms. Manning and Ms. Hughes via Zoom. Thank you. Okay, adopt, we're now up to agenda item nine, adop adoption of the agenda, modifications. I have a modification. Mrs. Riggs. Um, I would like to on, um, Action 11B4, uh, Bylaw 139. I would like to pull that as the um, Policy Review Committee Chair, I'd like to pull that for further evaluation and we need to look over it some more. So I'd like to um, take that off the agenda. Okay, okay, okay. Any, any other modifications? Okay, then the Chair will entertain a motion to approve the agenda as amended. Mrs. Felton, thank you. A second. second. Mrs. Anderson. Uh, all those in favor, please raise your hands. Madam uh, Chair, we have a unanimous vote with Ms. Manning and Ms. Hughes voting affirmative on Zoom. Thank you. That brings us to the consent agenda. So the items presented as part of the consent agenda for this evening. Uh, A is program evaluation schedule. Uh, we have two National Hispanic Heritage Month, Suicide Prevention Week, and Religious Exemptions. Uh, Modifications? Yeah. Do we do, do we vote first and then? That's for, forgive me. I didn't know if we we voted collectively first. This is the first time I've encountered them in this order. <laughs> yes. Yes. So. You, you typically have announced each item, and when you get to the resolutions, you will have that read. And that's just been your past precedent on consent. 
So we'll start again with A, Program Evaluation Schedule 2020-21, B, National Hispanic Heritage Month. Uh, Mrs. Melnick, can you share who's reading that this evening? That would be Mrs. Owens. Thank you. Ms. Owens, would you please? I would be happy to. Uh, Resolution for National Hispanic Heritage Month, September 15th through October 15th, 2020. Whereas one of our nation's greatest strengths is its vast diversity, which enables Americans to see the world from many viewpoints. And whereas Hispanic and Latino Americans have forged a proud legacy that reflects the spirit of our nation and community and whereas it is imperative for the good of our nation that schools continue to build awareness and understanding of the contributions made by people from all cultures and backgrounds, and whereas the study of these contributions, students may find role models whose participation, commitment, and achievement embody the American spirit and ideals, and whereas the school board of the city of Virginia Beach recognizes the importance of multicultural diversity education within our school division. Now therefore be it resolved that the school board of the city of Virginia Beach officially recognizes September 15th through October 15th as National Hispanic Heritage Month and be it further resolved that the school board of the city of Virginia Beach encourages all citizens to support and participate in the various school activities available during National Hispanic Heritage Month, and be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution be spread across the official minutes of this board, adopted by the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach this ninth day of September, 2020. Thank you. And now for uh, Suicide Pre Prevention Week, that would be Mr. Edwards this evening. I'm pleased to uh, be able to read a resolution for suicide prevention, September 6 through 12, 2020. It was 14 years ago yesterday that I lost my daughter to uh, a mental illness fatality. Whereas suicide is the 10th leading cause of deaths in the United States and the second leading cause of deaths among individuals between ages 15 and 24. Whereas suicide is the second leading cause of death in the state of Virginia amongst individuals ages 15 to 24. Whereas suicide strikes without regard to locality, socioeconomic status, ethnicity, religious preference or age, and whereas the United States, in the United States, one person completes suicide every 12.8 minutes. And there are 10 to 20 suicide attempts for each suicide completion. Whereas education and community involvement are known to be the most critical factors in preventing suicide. And whereas the school board of the city of Virginia Beach is focused on ways to educate students, parents, and staff about suicide and prevention of suicide. And whereas Virginia Beach City Public Schools through sustained and dedicated efforts has implemented all employees recognize a deep commitment at all levels to raise awareness of suicide and its prevention. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the school board of the city of Virginia Beach designates the week of September 6 through 12, 2020, as Suicide Prevention Awareness Week in the, in the Virginia Beach City Public Schools, and be it further resolved that strategies and activities to address suicide prevention and suicidal behaviors be ongoing in Virginia Beach City Public Schools, and be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution be spread across the official minutes of this board, adopted by the school board of the city of Virginia Beach this ninth day of September, 2020. Thank you, Mr. Edwards. 
Uh, we also have religious exemptions, which were available for us to, to review. Uh, so I guess a mo first ask for motions, and then the only one that would involve any discussion would be a program evaluation schedule. So I'll first ask for a motion to approve the consent it's, agenda. It's on consent. It's on consent. It wouldn't involve discussion. Um, we will cross that off. Okay. So motion to approve. I move to approve. Mrs. Riggs, thank you. A second. Mrs. Weems. Madam Chair, we have a unanimous vote with both uh, Manning and Hughes voting in the affirmative online. Thank you. Action item 11, personnel report, administrative appointments. Motion to approve. Mr. Edwards, a second. Mrs. Melnick, any discussion? Okay, please, all those in favor, please raise your hand. And Madam Chair, we have a unanimous vote. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Spence, are there any appointments to share? <clears throat> yes, ma'am, there are. Um, if I'll start with Danielle Craven. Uh, Mrs. Craven has served with distinction as a teacher um, in Virginia Beach at Fairfield Elementary, Ocean Lakes Elementary, Point of View in Indian Lakes. She has uh, recently been serving as a teacher in the Office of Programs for Exceptional Children. And I am pleased to note uh, that this evening you've accepted our recommendation for her to serve as the next assistant principal at Kimsville Meadows Elementary School. Um, the reason for that position being vacant is because I'd like to recognize Lisa Souter. Lisa has served with distinction as a teacher in the South Bend Community School Corporation and then uh, for 20 years as a principal in the Michigan City Area Schools in Indiana came to Virginia Beach most recently and was appointed as an assistant principal at Kinsville Meadows Elementary School. And this evening you've accepted our recommendation for her serve as the next principal of Tallwood Elementary School. And the reason for that vacancy <clears throat> is because of the next um, um, administrative appointment and that is recognizing Dr. Tamika Singletary Johnson, you all will recognize uh, Dr. Singletary Johnson, who has served with distinction across North Carolina and Virginia as an assistant principal, principal, and teacher. Uh, she was a principal at Westside Elementary School in Roanoke City Public Schools, uh, a principal at Tallwood Elementary School here in Virginia Beach. And this evening, I'm pleased that you've accepted our recommendation for her to serve as the next principal of Salem Middle School, where she will replace Dr. Smith, who you will recall is joining us here in central office. And so congratulations to all three of these candidates. Thank you. And we continue to say we look forward to uh, congratulating them in person soon. <laughs> all right, so uh, now action item b policy committee recommendations and we will go be going through these one at a time so we begin with the prc equity policy and before discussion asking for a motion to approve mrs anderson a second mrs riggs okay discussion Okay, we'll begin with Mrs. Anderson. I have three questions that I would like to ask administration to answer about these <clears throat> because there have been some misinformation into the public and so I would like the administration to answer these, these questions specifically to address the misinformation that has been put out into the public. Number one, will the education equity policy give the superintendent a blank check to hire outside consultants to implement these programs and conduct audits without requiring competitive bidding or approval from the school board? Uh, I can speak to I that one. Dr. 
So I just want to take that. Uh, that 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 sorry, that's Cami Linetti, School Board Legal Counsel. There's been some misconceptions on that. This policy does not waive any of the requirements for procurement or contract review policy. I'm not sure where that concept came up. This is authorizing him to go ahead and spend money in this area, but he will have to follow all the same procurement rules, contracting rules that he follows with anything else. There's nothing about this policy that exempts that. And I'll point out there's additional policy that the school board already has that authorizes the employment of consultants by the superintendent. The school board's well aware that we regularly use consultants, and that appears to be the the sticking point is language about the use of consultants and, and, and um, being authorized to do that. I would interpret that as transparency to this board that consultants likely will need to be used to complete these processes. And it seems to me transparency in the policy is important to those who spoke tonight. Thank you. Uh, second of all, does the proposed education equity policy call for the use of the book Courageous Conversations for training purposes of our teachers and staff? And is there a plan by administration to utilize the book for future professional training? Um, thank you for asking that question. Uh, um, uh, there seems to be a great deal of misconception out there about what the, what the policy itself does. The policy does not call for any specific training. The policy says that training will be required, and it does not say that it will be courageous conversations, or in Virginia Beach's case, what we talk about is candid conversations or any other training. Do we have plans to use uh, the book by Glenn Singleton? That book's listed as a resource. Um, it has been, as you heard tonight, a resource that's been used in the city of Virginia Beach since, since 2007. Um, and has been adapted into what's been called candid conversations about race, uh, which has been a professional development that has happened here since 2007. We haven't used it specifically in Virginia Beach since 2017 uh, because we uh, put our time and energy, and Dr. Perrick can talk about it, into uh, culturally responsive practices trainings. Um, but I will note, um, based on some of what I've heard about it, um, I think there are some significant misconceptions about the training here in Virginia Beach. And I will state and reemphasize what I heard this evening uh, and what I've heard in my time here. And, and I would ask any board members who've been here since 2007 if you've ever heard anything negative about this training, because I don't think you will have. I have not. Um, we are not in the practice of humiliating people when we do professional development. We're in the practice of having people be reflective and think about their role as an educator and how they interact with students and how they interact with others. And so um, I just think it's important to be very clear about what we do and we don't do in Virginia Beach. And, and so that's how I would address that. And I don't know, Dr. Parrott, if you want to elaborate on that. And again, the, the professional learning series that we call Candid Conversations About Race it's based on some of the conditions, the, the conditions, the reflective tools that are mentioned in Glenn Singleton's work, Courageous Conversations About Race. But like Dr. Spence shared, um, as a facilitator of the Candid Conversations About Race, um, at my arrival here in Virginia Beach, I've heard nothing but positive comments, as you've heard from some of our guest speakers during um, speaker comments um, this evening. And so, um, again, I don't know where some of the... Um, perceptions are, are coming from, but I've not heard of them from teachers or educators or leaders that I've worked with around the series. And like Dr. Spence shared, this is not something that's being planned as part of the equity policy. And my third question is, is VBCPS promoting abolitionist teaching? Well, so, I mean, I can answer that and then I'll let Dr. Parrott elaborate. I mean, the short version is we are not promoting abolitionist teaching, nor are we not promoting abolitionist teaching. We haven't explored that as a, as a, as a concept here in Virginia Beach. And to be clear, one more time, because there seems to be a running misconception um, about this on social media, the equity policy does not speak to what specific training will be provided. And there's a reason for that, because you want to be able to have a policy that drives the need for equity, that gives clear direction about what equity work should occur to include um, an assessment, to include the development of a plan with, with the school board and the superintendent, and presumably then that plan would discuss what training might be required as, as is laid out in the equity policy. And I would call that similar to much of what's in policy 
uh, throughout the board's policies. So, for example, you have a professional development policy that talks about the fact that professional development will be provided and professional development activities will be made available to teachers and other staff. It does not specify what the professional development activities are. It's assumed, I believe, that those will be driven by the strategic plan and the division's goals that are established by the school board through that strategic plan. And in fact, you all know very well that's exactly what happens, that we come to you and we talk on an annual basis about the professional development that we're providing and we workshop that and you have the opportunity to ask about it and it's always driven by that. I would view this policy as doing a similar, uh, as having a similar function as other professional development policies, that it says you will have training, you will develop a plan that addresses what you find in an assessment and then you'll do that concurrently with the school board, which is explicitly stated in the plan, and that you'll then report back on that work on an annual and ongoing basis with the school board. And so I think it's just important. I think I'm going to say this personally. If you're familiar with the concept of a red herring, I think talking about the specific trainings and then cherry picking pieces of what people have said about those trainings out is an intent to, to to turn people away from what we're actually talking about, which is a policy to drive equity work, not to, um, as we heard people say, you know, shame teachers or guilt children because of the color of their skin. That is the furthest thing from what we would ever uh, do in the city of Virginia Beach. And so um, I hope that speaks to that question. I'm, I'm fairly passionate about that response because obviously I've, I've gotten quite a few emails um, suggesting otherwise. Dr. Okay. Parrott, I don't know if you'd like to. I think you covered it well, Dr. Spence. Okay. Thank you. I, I'm sorry. No, thank you. <laughs> and, and if I may, before we get to uh, more questions, Dr. Parrott, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking ma many of the public may not have been tuned in two weeks ago. Could you just provide for us um, what the purpose of the policy is and and perhaps also this policy development process. I think that would be a good starting point for our further discussion. Thank you, Chairwoman um, Rye. And so on August 25th, um, it was presented to as information to our school board equity policy that was um, um, brought to the um, policy review committee on behalf of our two school board members that serve on our equity council, Mrs. Sharon Felton and Ms. Jessica Owens. Um, prior to sharing um, this idea around the development of equity policy, the equity council met prior, and you heard this from one of our speakers this evening, prior to COVID, prior to most of the racial unrest that has occurred since we've been out away from school, um, the Equity Council, along with some other stakeholders from some of our high schools and middle schools to include teachers and students, we held an Equity Council meeting. And at that meeting, the, the purpose of that meeting was to look at our strategic framework and really focus on the six um, equity emphases that are throughout our new strategic framework that was adopted in January 2020. And so at that time, we were discussing what are some obstacles to meeting these equity goals that we have here? What are some things that we're currently doing that we can move this equity work forward as it relates to our equity um, emphases throughout our strategic framework? And several themes arose from those conversations with students, with staff and with members of our equity council. And one of the themes that we brought forward was the idea and the development of equity policy to ground our work, to show our commitment to equity in Virginia Beach City Public Schools. And policy, we all know, drives action, drives what we do, drives what we support, and drive what we hold account, what we find to be an accountability measure. And so in early June, Mrs. Felton and Mrs. Owens um, presented this idea of equity policy to our PRC. And they were open um, and, 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 and they were everything we want to see in our teachers and our leaders, that they were open, they asked thoughtful questions, they were uncomfortable, <laughs> but they wanted to understand what do we mean by educational equity? What do you mean by racial disparities? If inequities, one of our members of our PRC passionately said, if, if there are inequities, just get rid of them. Let's fix it now, right? And, and, and that's the passion that, that 
our teachers and our leaders should bring to educational equity. If the inequities exist, let's address them. Let's face them. Let's be courageous. And so on August 25th, um, after hours of meeting with the PRC, after many drafts and conversations around what does it mean for equity policy in Virginia Beach City Public Schools, we developed belief statements, our commitments, our accountability measures. What is educational equity? And so through those conversations on August 25th, we presented a draft of that equity plan that was developed. And so now we're here, now we're here to adopt this most important policy that will continue to drive our work here in Virginia Beach City Public Schools. And then we had some other conversations and stuff on August 25th as well. <laughs> I try to block all that other stuff out, but, but, but again, that's why we're here now. And, um, and this will be the last thing I'll say, I'll step aside and, and, and wait to, to be called to the dais. But I would like to thank our teachers and our students and our leaders that are watching, that were here this evening, who called in to voice their um, support for educational equity. Like you, we don't have all the answers either, but we're in this together. And this work is not just for black and brown students in Virginia Beach. This work is for all students in Virginia Beach City Public Schools. And so I want you to know I stand with you. We stand side by side in this work. And so again, thank you for taking the time to, to stay tuned this evening, to be here this evening, to share your comments and to call in. And so again, thank you. If I get rushed out of here this evening, I didn't want to miss an opportunity to say that. Thank you. I wouldn't get too far from that podium. <laughs> All right, we have Mrs. Melnick and then Mrs. Felton. I'm sorry if I repeat a little, but um, these are my thoughts. When people incite the public on social media with false or misleading information, it sadly invites the vitriol that we received over the past two weeks. Statements like, enough of the Spence political theater. Why do the taxpayers in this city have to be forced to continue to be assailed by, the so about, by this socialist buffoon? That we're indoctrinating our teachers into an initiative of leftist uh, abolitionist teaching. We need to reject this idiocy. Leave the abolitionist teaching and other racist practices up to the anarchists and left-wing zealots that hate this country. And a, a truly egregious one, which appears on Mrs. Manning's school board Facebook page that states in part, Jewish people created critical race theory and have been using it against white people for decades unopposed like this filthy rat with a picture of a Jewish author and historian, a post that to this day uh, was not refuted by Mrs. Manning and it, it's still sitting there untouched today. So that leads me to the equity policy. What is it about this policy that states the school board and the school division are committed to developing a capacity for cultural competence and a commitment to equity and inclusion to enable the fulfillment of its core values and lifelong learning capacities? That is, why is that so offensive? It aligns directly with our compass to 2025 goals which received unanimous, a unanimous stamp of approval by this school board. So what's changed? Why the very loud opposition to this policy? Again, and I repeat, um, I ask that people do not reference blank checks to hire outside consultants. That is not the truth. Dr. Spence responded to that, and we have policies in place to cover that. Please do not reference abolitionist teachings. We are not engaging in it and uh, we are not promoting it. Please do not reference stakeholder input. This division has a robust policy development process where policies come to the board through the policy review committee. All members of the public have the opportunity to provide input to the school board on its policy deliberations, which occur every single month. The policy review committee has monthly public meetings and, and we as school board members are always available by phone or email. I would like to note that Courageous Conversations again 
started in Virginia Beach in 2007. It was in chapter one of our former superintendent, Dr. Merrill's playbook. Um, four members um, of this current board were members of Dr. Merrill's board. The training includes a set of norms and protocols intended to help educators understand why achievement inequality persists and learn how, and learn how they may develop practices, approaches, and processes that promote educational equity and excellence for all students. Not one school board member spoke in opposition to this training, not since 2007. We as a school board are in a position to make real change through policy, which quite frankly should have happened years ago. So tonight I wanna to thank Crystal Felton. Tonight she said, you cannot be afraid of a policy with teeth. And Brian Owens, who reminded us that cultural competence is not a threat. Cultural competence is education. Um, I also want to take one minute to recognize Paul Telkamp, Joyce Williams, Elizabeth Williams, Amani Williams, Naya Williams, Reuben Williams, Susan Hippen, Jennifer Trice, Maurice Hawkins, Jennifer Franklin, Melissa Smith, Brooke DeWitt, Joelle Jones, Perez Gatling, Crystal Felton, Angela Allison Davis, Audrey McDaniel, Keenan Tyler, Francis Knight Thompson, Carrington Smith, Brian Owens, Venus Marshall, Joyce Williams, Lindsay Nathaniel, Kelly Walker, Chona O'Galvin, Dr. Valika Gatling, Megan Rafferty, Sherelle Milo, Connor Epley, Chevette Jeffries, Danielle Coughlin, Suzanne Saltesiak, Sanaya Bagley, Donna Hamid, Lisa Turner, Harry Graber and Dr. Amelia Ross Hammond for sharing your stories with the school board this evening. I will be voting yes on this policy for all of our students in Virginia Beach. And one last thank you to Andy Bond, who reminded this Catholic girl that today is the feast day of St. Peter Claver, who is considered a heroic example of what should be the praxis of love and exercise of human rights. And if that's not divine intervention, I don't know what is. Madam Chair, please add Laura Hughes to the queue. Thank you, Mrs. Melnick, uh, Mrs. Felton, and then Mr. Edwards. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd just like to have the administration of Dr. Spencer or Dr. Pert to address this. I, I heard uh, a couple of um, um, inquiry about the Equity Council and the representation there. Can you tell me the misconception that's there and what is the format of the Equity Council and what it represents? Mrs. Felton, I, I would like to um, provide some context to around the Equity Council. And, and so since my arrival here in Virginia Beach as the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Officer, um, I inherited Equity Council members. They were already members on the Equity Council. But I also invited new members to join our council. And so the 19 members that currently are listed on bbschools.com as members of our Equity Council are a combination of both. Um, the invitation that was extended to members of our community, both internal and external, that now belong to our um, Equity Council are members that either participated in programs that are supported by my office, expressed an interest to me, um, either by calling me, emailing me, reaching out to me um, to sh share an interest in joining our Equity Council. Um, the individuals that are current members of our Equity Council are equity-minded, are equity-focused, and they want to support the school division in moving equity efforts forward. Um, on our call today, one of our um, um, callers in, Lindsay Nathaniel, she is a parent that I was in contact with, unfortunately, for a situation that neither of us really want to have conversation about, about an activity that happened in one of our school campuses. But through that conversation and through that dialogue, Ms. Nathaniel has now been invited to join our Equity Council. She expressed an interest, uh, but most importantly, I should back up that on July 8th or July 9th, the, the day that we hosted our um, um, webinar, um, um, how to talk about race 
and equity and other recent events. Um, during that webinar, we provided an opportunity for our viewers that if they wanted to engage in equity work here in Virginia Beach City Public Schools, we encouraged them to visit bbschools.com and we had an interest form there. And from that conversation, we had, I believe I recall there's eight individuals that expressed interest. Ms. Nathaniel went later on, but she also expressed interest there. So um, I can tell you that there is no formal structure, I'm not saying that there should be or there sh should not be one, but um, it's not excluding anyone. But if interested equity-minded equity individuals would like to be part of the Equity Council at this time, they just need to reach out. The interest um, form is on bbschools.com. If you go to the diversity, equity, and inclusion page, and the next step is I will reach out to you, have a conversation, because we really want those who are committed to doing the work for the long term. And many of the Equity Council members that are still members today have been in equity work through two or three diversity equity um, officers and so they're committed to this work and have always been committed to this work and so we want those who are in it for the long term and for times like this and so um, that's really the, the structure of the equity council well Ms. dr parrot I, I i realize and i see that no is advisory board or committee or commission is put behind equity council. Mm -hmm. So therefore, no members to this day, you said, has not been appointed. Mm -hmm. So you might have hit on it again, but how, how do you get members or how you get ones to come in to your meeting? How do you process that? The only members that are appointed to the equity council are two school board members that serve on our equity council. Others have been um, previous members of the council and just continue to participate. And others I have personally invited or someone in our school division or our community has said, you may want to reach out to this certain individual. Um, I, I know that one of our um, executive directors in the Department of Teaching and Learning, she um, had a member who's um, a, a member of SEAC, and she said, I, I believe this parent could probably serve you well on the Equity Council. So she gave that parent the information, and, and so that parent now is going to be invited to the Equity Council. And uh, what I can say now is that the equity assessment that we plan to have pending policy adoption will take a look at our equity council, at the structure, at our ways of inviting members. And those metrics could be something that we can recon reconsider how the equity council is formed. Because I heard loud and clear from many of the speakers this evening that there is a misconception that there's only a certain group of people who should be part of the equity council and that is false. But I do understand that perceptions is your only reality. So, you know, we, the equity assessment could be a great opportunity for us to evaluate not just our teaching and learning structures and our offices and hiring practices, but also our advisory boards to include the equity council. Thank you, Dr. Perry. With that said, Chair uh, Ryan, I'd like to continue and move forward. I just like to thank you and my colleagues. Tonight, I declare my support of this equity policy. First, I would like to thank the PRC committee and the diversity, equity, and inclusion team that was expedient in collaborating to support this equity work so needed in this school division. Since this equity policy had been put forth, it has been met with opposition, assassination of individual character, and the horrific acts of dismantling the policy beyond recognition. We as board members, administrators, and parents realize that the purpose of education is to create opportunities for students to look at the world for themselves, which assists them in making their own decision. August 25th, 2020, the question was asked, what is intercultural competence? I'd like to expand on this thought, and it's this. The ability to shift cultural perspective and adapt behavior and actions from one culture to another. This starts with everyone realizing the differences between themselves and people from other countries or other backgrounds, especially differences in attitude and value. Our mission here at the school division is to put students first, seek growth, to be open to change, do great works together 
and value differences. This policy is going to help us to further our mission. How can you put students first when you don't seek to know more about them? How can we say we are open to change if we don't embrace being open to change? How will we do great work together and value differences if we don't understand the differences? This policy is not garbage. To say that, you are literally saying to the VBCPS students and staff, you don't matter. And that you are considered as trash and not to embrace a policy that assists in furthering the mission of the school division. It grieves me that today in the 2020, I am a continuation, I am in a continuation of fight that my parents fought for me, that I fought for my children, and now I'm having to fight for my grandchildren. I am the parent of a gifted child who was kept out of the gifted program back in the 1980s because she was that smart for, she was too smart for a black girl and not just a smart girl. No worries, she made it and is successful today, but that still stays with her and she's in her 40s. There has been a public outcry for change, justice, equality, and inclusion. As much of, as some of my colleagues and their supporters want to ignore it, Virginia Beach is not immune. I am encouraging my colleagues not to fight against this policy. We can't succumb to the same threats faced by the many black civil rights leaders and account less the works of white allies, including Viola Luizzo, a housewife who was killed by the Klan's for her advocacy of civil rights, and Charles Goodall, the father of Roger Goodall, commissioner of the NFL. When you fight against the equity policy and threaten to do bodily harm, if we don't pull the policy, you are sending a message of bullying. The VBCPS school board have policy for bullying and harassments that are designed to influence and determine all major decision and action. When students come to the board after acts of discipline that has taken place within the boundaries of the school setting, we don't accept it from students, and so it will not be accepted from the adults. There have been questions of whether the community embraces this policy. As board members, we all know that policy drives practice. Policy have come to the boards through the policy review committee and always have since I've been on this board. I find it very interesting that some members of this board act as though there hasn't been enough time for the community input on this particular policy, but have never questioned community input on the countless others that have been heard modified and passed month after month. This policy just so happened to impact and provide equity opportunities for black and brown students and staff, and there is a sudden in, uh, insistence that there hasn't been enough community input on it. This policy has gone through the same process that every other policy passed by this board has gone through. As always, all members of the public has had opportunity to provide input to the school board on policy through regular public meetings and by sending us email. This equity policy came to the board following our usual process and the policy has been included as both an information item and an action item to provide opportunity for public comments, which is the board's norm. I can't help but wonder why now, why this policy that focuses on truly understanding cultural differences and evaluating the decision we make as board members with a true equity lens. Understanding cultural differences should not separate us from each other, but rather cultural diversity brings a collective strength that can benefit all of humanity. I would encourage all of my colleagues to consider these thoughts I have presented before you and vote yes in support of this equity policy. Thank you. Oh, oh, excuse me. Thank you, Mrs. Felton. Mr. Edwards and then Mrs. Riggs. <clears throat> Some have asked, why now? How did this come up? Well, to 
piggyback on what Mrs. Felton just said. I mean, the strategic plan that we passed about six months ago uh, had the, the, the basic fundamental requirements strewn throughout all, all, all of the, uh, the goals. Um, this is, this is, it's timely. We're, we're, we've got good company. Uh, this is the September current issue of the Virginia Business Magazine. Its cover story is titled, Moving the Needle. Companies prioritize equity and diversity. Um, so that, that's what shows you what's going on across the Commonwealth. I mean, this is the right thing to do and the right time to do it. The policy is, is a much needed capstone to manage this critical function. We've had policies and programs, anti-bullying, anti-harassment, candid conversations, but there's a lot more to do and the policy calls for an audit to determine exactly what those additional needs are. We've had an equity council for years as, as has been discussed. Um, and if there's a need to expand its representation, and there probably is, then, I, then it'll be done. Uh, and the policy will, <laughs> when passed, will provide that it does get done. Um, as one of our speakers suggested, why do this? Do an assessment first. Uh, I wish he'd read the policy. That's the first thing we're going to do. Um, and the misconception over the contracting has already been addressed. Uh, fundamentally, equal opportunity and resources for all sounds so sweet, but it is so wrong. Our job and it's been that way, is to provide the unequal opportunities and resources to allow each and every student to develop their full potential. That basic premise was slaughtered and attacked two weeks ago. And for the last two weeks, I have just gritted my teeth and, and crucified myself for not speaking up two weeks ago. Um, that's, I mean, we, we've been doing that, um, but we need to do more of it, and this policy is going to make sure we do. So, um, obviously, I, I support the, the policy and, and appreciate it. The, the good work that got it to where it is. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Edwards. Mrs. Riggs, and then we'll have Mrs. Weems. Um, first of all, as the um, chair of the Policy Review Committee, um, when Jessica Owens had asked about, uh, had asked the, um, the committee about, not the Policy Review Committee, but the governance committee about, you know, uh, putting it on our agenda for our retreat. I'm like, well, let me reach out to her because I think it's important that we get started with this and listen to what she and uh, Sharon Felton um, wanted to tell us about and, and present to us. So with starting with that, I felt like it was time to get this ball rolling. I knew we had a lot to talk about in our uh, retreat, and I wasn't sure we'd get enough time to be able to, to spend on this equity policy because I felt like it needed to be presented. So in talking with Sharon Felton and Jessica Owens, um, they're like, we need Dr. Parrott too. So it was, it was a, a way to get that ball rolling. It needed to be. But this happened back in May, um, the, or the end of May, and it was before all of the the um, marching and all of the stuff became a really major thing. I mean, it started, but not like that. And I was like, it had nothing to do with that. It had everything to do with this is the right thing to do. And it's something we have been needing for a long time. We have got policies among policies. 
It was over 700 at one time. I think we're, we've got it whittled down to maybe 500, 600. <laughs> so, but we did, we did not have a policy for equity. Such an important policy to move forward and to make sure everybody, every child in our system was given that, that equity and equality and in, in offer to them in their education. So it was, to me, I think it was very important. And um, I appreciate the opportunity to spend time, and I want to thank Sharon Felton for inviting me to, um, and uh, Michael Berlucci uh, to a, a conversation with uh, several of our students, one from Bayside, uh, his twin brother, mothers, his mother, um, our um, police department, and we had a, a nice conversation at MOCA and some, some heartfelt uh, stories that we heard from these kids and these students. So those are the kind of things that we need to be hearing and those are the kind of things tonight that we heard, the stories that really make a difference. And they're, they are so important. Um, um, there's just one question and either Dr. Spencer um, Dr. Parrott can answer that I have. Is the policy geared toward a certain race or is it a policy geared to show equity for all students, teachers, and staff of VBCPS? Because I've heard that as well. I just think it needs to be reiterated what that policy is for. So the, the policy is an equity policy that crosses many protected classes. And so if you read the policy, there's two specific definitions around equity. And one talks about racial equity, and then the next one talks about social equity. And the social equity uh, definition speaks specifically to the societal factors, other societal factors that, that create barriers to student success. And the need for the equity work to address other societal factors in addition to race. So race is, is certainly part of the work that has to be addressed, racial inequities also other societal factors. Both of them are included in the equity policy. So for those who spoke up tonight about special education and the need to address um, other issues, that's all there in the work that has to get done. And the, the, the notion of an, the reason the policy matters before an assessment, because I've heard that too, Mr. Edwards, the reason the policy matters before an assessment is because you got to define what are you assessing. And because, you know, you can go out and hire an equity uh, assessment you know, to, to look at a specific issue, or you can say, these are the things defined in policy that we need to uncover, flip the rocks over, make sure we're paying attention to, and build a plan around. Co anchored in the six equity emphases of the board's strategic plan. And so, yeah, I uh, thank you for asking. Again, another misconception that's been actively floated. This is an equity policy that crosses many of the factors that impede access to equitable educational outcomes. Thank you. I just felt like that needed clarification. I appreciate you clarifying that for us. Mrs. Riggs, on behalf of the Policy Review Committee, we struggled with this for a couple months, and I did push back. I pushed back heavily on Dr. Parrott. What do you mean by equity? I pushed on school women. Do you understand what you mean? And we had a long discussion. One of our rewrites was to make sure we specifically put in the same categories that we have in our non-discrimination. These are our protected classes uh, to make sure that people understood that that was something you were going to look at. And I, we did, and I pushed Dr. Parrott to rewrite it, and I rewrote it a couple times myself. And PRC wanted to do, what do we mean by equity and who's included in that? And my understanding with Dr. Parrott and the Equity Council is we wanted everyone to have an inclusion on there. There are discussions on race because our strategic plan already has dealt with some of those issues. So we're a little ahead in that area. This is something we've worked on for many years. But she made it clear to me that the intent was they were going to try to work in all this by this equity assessment, all the other protected classes and how they were going to be impacted. So it, the most recent rewrite of this policy has been very clear that that was it. And we structured it out, as you'll see the definitions that show up. And, and I pulled this because I looked at other equity policies for other school divisions and other organizations and came up with the terms e racial equity because that is something we're 
a bit ahead of in some of the other areas. And then social equity, I put the other categories on there because there was an easy way to do that. That could be defined differently. That was just something that I'd seen somewhere else and thought that that would categorize it. So that's how we got to this. But it was my understanding, pushing back, talking with um, Dr. Parrott, that the intent was to include all the different protected classes that might be um, facing inequities in the school division. Thank you. And, and I, I know this because of being on the policy review committee, how much time that um, Cammie Linetti spent w with Dr. Parrott and um, John Sutton in making sure that our questions, when it was first presented to us, our questions being the policy review committee, were answered and um, reworked and made sure that they were all included. So we want, I want to make sure that the public knows this and knows how much time we spent in this. This wasn't something that was rushed. And I keep hearing that it was rushed or rushing through this. No, this has been something that's been a long time coming and needing it. But we needed, we did ask the many questions and worked with this a lot, um, as we do with a lot of uh, policies. And so I just want to make sure that that is very clear to the public. Thank you. And I will support this equity policy. Thank you. So Mrs. Weems and then Mrs. Hughes is next. Um, yes, I want to thank all those, um, as Dr. Parrott thanked for those who waited around and spoke and supported this, but I always also want to thank those who came with reservations and do not support it because I think diversity of thought, I don't think it makes you good or bad or don't, I don't think it makes you not care about equity or not care about children. I didn't hear a lot of extreme thoughts today um, that I had objection to. I just heard a lot of people um, concerned and a lot of folks saying we need a better plan, we need to understand this uh, and to maybe pause. Um, we had about 70% of speakers tonight um, support it on emails the last two weeks. We had 80% of our emails not support it. We have a petition of about 300 that have signed not supporting it. So it is a controversial subject, um, and it's a it's it's an emotional subject, and it, it's it's um, you know kind of hard to to really digest it. And I, I know, Miss Riggs, you say that we've been working on it. And I do think the equity committee and the school board members, Miss Felton and Miss Owen, have been working for it. But I do feel that I wish that the public would have had more um, insight, more collaboration more um, input in, during the process instead of just coming afterwards. So, um, but, you know, I've got some comments and, and I'm gonna, uh, I've got some questions too within my comments, but first and foremost, I think equity is of extreme importance. I completely support e educational equity. Um, I think that the concept of this policy has tremendous merit. Um, no matter where you live, what you look like, what you believe or how you learn, our students deserve and must be afforded all, all resources and opportunities for them to be academically successful. All of our students deserve love, dignity, and respect. But that being said, I think the process for developing this policy falls a little short of what the school board needed and what our community needs in order to fully endorse it. Um, and I think that that one of my questions and, and comments, and I did reach out to Dr. Paird, I had a wonderful conversation with Ms. Felton yesterday, as we always do. Um, but I think anytime you have a, of a committee, especially I think this, this committee, the advisory committee, and, and it is an advisory board, I mean, they're advising us on, on this policy. Um, I think in this particular case, I would have felt much more comfortable if the 19 members, is that he's, how many people are in it? Because I've heard 19 and I've heard 24. Um, there are 19. Okay. Counting me, there's 20. I'm okay. Um, I question if, if races, ethnicities, educational backgrounds, socioeconomics, learning disability, disabilities, military expensive um, experience, faith, LGBTQ. Um, I mean, that's our diverse community, and I don't think it was represented in this committee and I'm not faulting you I think this is a time where we really need to look at this council slash advisory committee and I think we should do it like we do the others you know we changed the whole process a couple years ago where we vet 
like the SEAC and the technical and the gifted, where we make sure that we have representation, like for the SEAC committee, because I'm much familiar with that, with the representation that that different disabilities are represented on that committee, different zones throughout the whole city. And I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed that it wasn't. And we've been hearing a lot of comments, and I totally agree that when you're having advice for an equity policy, that the people advising should represent your community equitably. And I don't, and I don't see that. Correct me if I'm wrong. And so the Equity Council is, um, uh, it's it's uh, made up of members from diverse people, um, places, um, experiences, and, ro and roles in our community. Um, and just because um, African American may be the predominant race or ethnicity of our members, we all have a culture and they bring their cultural experiences to the Equity Council. We have teachers, we have leaders, we have former teachers and leaders in our school division, we have community members. And so I would say our equity council is diverse. We do have diverse perspectives. And um, if you're basing it solely on race that we don't have five white, five Filipino, five Hispanic, that may not be the case. And I'm not saying that's something that we, we shouldn't have. But right now we do have diverse perspectives and the equity council, the equity council that provided the components for now that we see as our draft equity policy, really the policy belongs to our PRC and our school administration. That's whose policy, this is their policy. The equity council provided recommendations and components to move this policy forward. Right, right. And, and, and it was an advisory. I mean, that's what I'm saying. This, this committee wasn't an advisory form. So I, I would have hoped that it had like Filipino representation, somebody from the LGBTQ, um, his, you know, all that that has been mentioned because I think that is a very, um, I, I agree with it and I think it has merit is what I'm saying. So yes, I, I was Smith, disappointed I in that and I hope that we take a look at that for in, Mrs. in the Weems, future. May and I again, just, you inherited that. So I'm, I'm not, I'm not I fingers. Some. I'm saying no, I know, approved. but may I just layer on? I think my specific concern here, and I just, I won't feel right if I don't say this. In my six years now, in my seventh year here, not once has anybody questioned the diversity of any other advisory committee. And those advisory committees represent students of all colors and from all across the city. And not once has anybody said, is the African-American perspective considered on that advisory committee, career technical education? Is the African-American perspective considered on the SEAC or the Hispanic perspective or the Latinx perspective considered on the SEAC since students of color are served in special education? Not once. Okay, and and I just want to get it all, I just need to say, okay. I find it really disturbing that this is the thing we're going to say now as a reason that this policy coming forward, which by the way was based on the VSBA model policy and policies from other school divisions out on the country, so not like sort of formed by, you know, uh, one, one group of people with no diversity of thought, but like, why now raise that question? I mean, we just approved a plan for gifted education, special education. We do it every year. I've never heard this conversation. I find that really disappointing. Well, I find that the, the topic, because we're talking about equity, and things need to be equitable. That's why it's coming up now. Well, and I and, and I don't and I, and I respectfully disagree because in special education and SEAC, that's why we changed the whole process to make sure that that different school zones were representative, and it's very important for different disabilities to be represented there. But, but not, I'll go on but not and, race, and this is about race. This is all about there's only black people on this no, committee. I, that's what's you, been said over and over again not all hear, week. I you did not hear you, what I said, Dr. Those Spence. Are the I said special that education, heard. faith, military expense, uh, experience, learning disabilities, socioeconomic, education back now, background, race, ethnicity. It was one of nine or ten things that I said, so you're not listening. Okay, well then, then I appreciate Dr. Parrott's response because racial differences alone does not reflect exactly the and, the, and of that's the why i listed nine or ten things because the policy is not about race well but when she said, said so. racial diversity alone was not the only thing you then continued to say but i still think it needs to be more diverse so yes of I, the I, nine different I just things find that i i think it needs to be more diverse in race more diverse in people with learning disabilities 
people in different faiths, people with military experience, because experience, because we have a huge cultural military population here. So I don't, you know, we can finish this later, but you're not hearing the nine or ten different categories, and you're concentrating on the one, and I'm not. So um, number, and then also, um, and, and I'm still confused. And I think what the confusion is, and 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 what I have a problem with is. I don't see why we couldn't have had an assessment or, or an audit first. We, we did the special education audit, and I don't think we had a policy for that. We just, you know, did the audit. Um, I, I don't know if it was called an audit with the gifted program. And so to me, we, if, if we would have an audit or an assessment first, I don't think you have to have a policy to do that because we've done it in the past. In the, in the past then it would bring forward, these are exactly the areas that we're falling short. Now the Equity Council and the school board can come up with a plan. This is how we're going to prioritize, because we've got lots of groups here. We've got lots of groups that, it, like we said, it goes cross-categorical cross, cross to different groups. How are we going to prioritize those groups? Well, this is the plan after our assessment. How are we going to afford to do it? This is the plan after the assessment. Um, what is the training going to look like? Well, this is, you know, based on the assessment, this is what the training is going to look like. What is the curriculum, if there is a curriculum, going to look like? Well, now that we've got the assessment. So that's the problem that I have is we've got this policy, but there's, I, I don't know what I'm, like, the training. What is it? Nobody can tell me what the training is. And now in one one place, Teachers are going to be evaluated, currently, let's see, um, requiring evaluation to incorporate culturally responsive teaching practices. Well, I, I don't even know what that means. I don't know what the training is going to mean. And, and we've heard all these things, and I'm not saying it's going to be that, but for you, for you to say, well, we're, we're just going to figure it out later and do it later, I don't know why we couldn't have had the assessment, the audit now, so that you could have then brought the plan to the board. So I don't understand that. And so, Mrs. Weems, uh, the, the plan will be brought to the board. Drafts of the plan will be brought to the board. But the importance of having the policy, because the policy outlines some of our commitments, and we want to ensure that when we plan our equity assessment, it is aligned with what we say our beliefs are, our commitments are. It's aligned with our strategic framework so that we are examining all areas that we say are important and that we say we need to take a closer look at. And so the 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 assessment will provide us um, after we meet with several groups, many of the groups that you outlined, our military families, our teachers, our, our, our students, and all these different focus groups we will hold to ensure that we are addressing the areas that our community, that our teachers, and that our students find to be areas of inequities and also find areas of strength because audits don't only identify problem areas. It also identifies areas in which things are working well. Right, so we right. want to continue to do those things. And so the assessment will then drive the, um, the, the equity plan that will come forward following the assessment because we need the findings, we need the recommendations, we need to hear from those diverse stakeholder groups that you mentioned so that our plan is truly meeting the needs of our diverse school community. And, and so, like you said, we may not need an equity policy to move forward with an audit, but policy drives what we find to be important as a school division. It drives how we can hold ourselves and our school community um, accountable for what happens in our schools. And so that's why it's policy first, equity audit, assessment, and then followed by our equity plan. Well, okay. I, I, I just... I, I just think it, it has been done a little bit backwards. I just like I just wish that we had had an audit like we did with special education. So then you bring back the plan. I just think it's a little bit backwards. But I, I think that I mean I think it's needed. But I think that that we need to do it in an equitable, a well discussed, and inclusive, and a non divisive ma manner. And I think that the school board members you know need to be more involved, and that the community needs to be more involved. Um, so I'll, I'll I'll rest it and give my colleagues. Their turn. Thank you. Madam Chair, can you please add Victoria Manning to the queue? Yes. Thank you, Mrs. Weems and Mrs. Hughes. Um, yes. Well, I would like to start with Mrs. Weems. 
Um, and I am not opposed to educational equity, but I mean, you really don't need to look any further, you know, to to understand the board's commitment to equity, to look at, you know, the committee assignments to make sure that they got rid of anybody who had a diverse opinion. Uh, Mr. Owens tonight talked about uh, discrimination. Um, ableist was one of the things he mentioned, but you watched eight people vote to send someone out of there today um, over a mask. Ms. Melnick talked about the commitment to listening to stakeholders, yet she had a whole list of topics that no one should mention later. Don't talk about this, don't talk about that. And continued by thanking every speaker who agreed with her, not every speaker who showed up and, and waited in the rain and that sort of thing. So I do not believe that we are super committed to diversity. The Equity Council does not appear to be diverse and race is one of the um, issues with diversity. And if, if race is one of the criteria, well, then, you know, several races should be um, part of the committee um, or the council, I'm sorry, the equity council, not committee. Um, one, of the, one of the items brought up at the meeting last week was the book, Courageous Conversations. And while Dr. Parrott stated at the meeting that there were no specific, specifics of the curriculum at that time, Dr. Spence did mention that Courageous Conversations is being used. In various emails, Ms. Rye and Ms. Anderson said that they're not being used. And then we had Mr. Burnsworth say, well, we've been using this for 14 years. So there's been a lot of misinformation and going back and forth there. And I have seen some items about Courageous Conversations that did not impress me. Um, I do think that when we create policies, there should be assessment and there should be some sort of at least blueprint for a curriculum at the time that the policy is, is implemented. I think people should have a more complete picture of what they're voting on. I'm not a fan of, you have to vote on it to see what's in it. Um, I don't feel like there was a lot of diversity in the development. There obviously is not transparency in curriculum since we don't have that yet. The writing that I saw did appear to be a blank check and carte blanche for hiring consultants by the superintendent with no board oversight, although something different is being said tonight. Um, Mrs. Felton brought up that we don't, we haven't had this kind of pushback on other policies asking to defer and discuss and discuss. But three that immediately come to mind are the Thoroughgood Hermitage situation, school start times and school reopening. So just in the last year, year and a half, um, those were three major things that there was a lot of pushback and not enough community input on necessarily. Sometimes the cart gets put before the horse. Um, and I would like to say that while we do need to make sure that we're providing tools to, to children who need them, I mean, obviously that's what equity is and I don't imagine how anyone could be against that. The truth is we have students with really active parents. We have students with parents who really aren't doing their job and everywhere in between. We have students who are economically privileged and some that are broke. We have children that are academically gifted, children that are average and children that require remediation. We have children that are athletically gifted and some that are not. I think that it is ridiculous to think you can look across the room at someone's complexion and tell which of those categories they fall in because we have children of every single skin tone that fall into every single one of those categories. And I just, I do not find it courageous to make anyone feel uncomfortable in his or her skin. Frankly, I call that bullying. And if, if you're looking at a person and you're seeing a color before you're seeing a person, you're the problem. I, I just, I find so much of this to be race-based. And to me, that is the problem. When you see a person, you should be seeing a person, not a color. So I, this is not something that I can support without more information and, and more transparency and what kind of curriculum 
is going to be developed. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Hughes. Mrs. Owens, Ms. Owens. Thank you. Um, when I was appointed to this board, uh, I was the second choice. Uh, I came on only after the first choice uh, stepped down due to social media posts that showed bias and problems. Uh, one of my first conversations after I was appointed with Dr. Spence uh, was about my experience as a student and as a parent. Uh, I loved my experience in Virginia Beach schools, but as an 11th grade minority pregnant student, I was subjected to words that were less than supportive by a counselor. It wasn't my first experience of discrimination within the schools. As a student or a parent as a, of a special education student. I grew up here in the city. My father is black. My mother is Puerto Rican. She served uh, Spanish-speaking fam families at Green Run Elementary for years. And my home was wonderfully multicultural, even though I've sat through multiple speakers today to come in, look at me, look at the color of my skin, and say, yep, no Latinos represented. I'm used to that. Sadly, being judged by my appearance is not new to me. But as a board, we can take steps so that it doesn't have to be the norm for students and teachers in the future. In all the time that I've been on this board, I've never heard my colleagues ask during a policy discussion, what was the racial makeup of the group that came up with this? I sit on a board that is more than 80% white. And prior to my appointment to the board, it was more than 90% white. Policies have been passed, and I didn't see any of the speakers that came in today to question, claiming that the policies that were passed by a majority white board couldn't benefit all students. But here we are today with these speakers for this policy. We've heard people ask, why, why do we need an audit? Why do we need a study? Why can't, let's just put our resources towards supporting students. And the answer to me seems simple. We tried that. That has not worked. We can't have the answers until we examine the problem. My brother attended ODC 20 plus years ago, and he was one of five black male students at the time. And the boys became close friends. They called each other the fifths, and uh, they still keep in contact today. But now in 2020, we still have a racial makeup at ODS that shows there has not been sufficient progress. And it's not because we don't have sufficient black and brown students testing in a gifted range. There has not been sufficient progress in too many areas for our black and brown students. So I do not want to slow down in passing an equity policy. I've waited my entire life for our district to make this commitment. My son's whole life. This district has moved slow enough. This policy was not sparked by George Floyd. And as uh, Karen Carrington from the Kempsville Black Student Union explained, students, staff, stakeholders, and others have come together to talk about how to remove barriers since the beginning of the year. The Equity Council is not new. It was already in place when I was appointed to the board back in 2019. And as board members, we all have the ability to attend any committees, whether appointed or not. I don't recall seeing Ms. Manning or any of the other board members who are criticizing the policy and questioning the racial makeup at any of the meetings that I've attended. At the last board meeting, I was at home and was shocked to hear Ms. Manning say that she knows the needs because she herself was a minority student, as if it's something that you can grow out of. This is the kind of statement that is offensive. I was offended. Policies are meant to provide guidelines and grow with our needs. I'd love to see the Equity Council continue to grow with additional representation. And the Equity Audit will help look at 
how to increase diversity on all of our committees and processes. Equity Council included. So let's take the first step and get started. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Silence. Mrs. Manning. Um, so first I want to address an accusation by Ms. Melnick that I take great offense to. She's blaming me for a statement that someone else made on my public social media page that I, as an elected official, am not allowed to delete. One of thousands of comments that I get on my page that I cannot control. That was wrong of her to make that accusation. Secondly, um, at the last meeting, I was just trying to ask some questions to gather some information about what the mandatory training would be. And Dr. Spence did kindly provide some information about what we're currently using. And he stated that we were currently using courageous conversations about race. And uh, Dr. Parrott also said the same thing. So, but now I'm hearing tonight that that's not the case. So. I'm not sure what the discrepancy is there. Um, Ms. Melnick also mentioned abolitionist teaching and said that, that we're not doing that. However, I do know that is something that is being encouraged and teachers across this division have been a part of the training on Love's abolitionist teaching. And I'm happy to provide anyone proof of that if they would like it. Um, to address Ms. Owen's um, statement, that she was offended by my comment about being a minority student. So that comment was made right after Dr. Parrott was discussing what our minority students are, including uh, being a, a, a poor student, being economically disadvantaged. And that is what I was referring to in that statement. And I also take offense by someone looking at my skin and judging my race. My maternal grandmother was Native American. Now I don't look like most of my family. I have blonde hair, blue eyes. Most of my family have dark hair, dark eyes. I don't, I don't fit in there and I don't look like them. So Miss Owens is judging me by the color of my skin as well. So I take offense to that as well. Um, I would like to be able to support an equity policy and an equity audit or assessment. But I feel that this particular one needs to be more defined. And that's why I would like to make a substitute motion to defer a vote on this equity policy and send it back to the Planning and Performance Monitoring Committee to address the following outstanding questions and unknowns. Number one, define what the mandatory training will be Number two, define a budgeted amount to implement the policy. Number three, address the concerns that not all stakeholder groups, including special education, have not been represented. And further, that the PPMC also provide a recommendation to the board for an outside unbiased third party to conduct an equity assessment or audit to, be, to determine the reason for disparities among all stakeholder groups prior to a policy being voted on in order to properly address inequity concerns. I'll second that. Okay, I, I was waiting to finish your comment. Comments before we ask for a second, Mrs. Manning? Yes, I am, thank you. All right. So is there a second? Yes. Okay. I'm sorry, Lauren, you have a second. So can you restate uh, your motion before we uh, ask for discussion of vote? Sure. Um, to defer a vote on the equity policy and send it to the Planning and Performance Monitoring, Monitoring Committee to address the following outstanding questions and unknowns. Number one, define what the mandatory training will be. Number two, define a budgeted amount to implement the policy. Number three, 
address the concerns that not all stakeholder groups, including special education, have been represented, and further that the PPMC also provide a recommendation to the board for an outside unbiased third party to conduct an equity assessment or audit to determine the reason for disparities among all stakeholder groups prior to a policy being voted on in order to properly address inequity concerns. Thank you. Question specific to the motion. Mrs. Holtz. Does this have any effect on the budget? Have we even looked at that or? No, ma'am, we have not looked at the budget as it relates to conducting the third party equity audit. But, but do you think it will or? It, it does have financial uh, implications. It, it's not cost neutral. It, it, it will cost money. Okay, thank you. It costs either way, right? So, yeah. but it definitely costs money. So I'll just add one, one comment speaking to the motion as I jotted them down. Thank you, Mrs. Manning, for repeating that a lot of these seem to be exactly what we'll be asking of our third party assessment uh, consultant. Uh, and, and so I understand the motions requesting that or this go to the PPM committee. Uh, but I see it as I see this as the role of the uh, part of the role of the third party assessment slash audit the training, the, the uh, you know, the other recommendations with some possible associated costs, uh, stakeholder groups. Uh, this is what I would expect of our third party consultant. Is there any other discussion? Okay, then please. Uh, so all those in favor of the substitute motion presented by Mrs. Manning, please raise your hands. Madam Chair, in favor, a vote was positive for Ms. Weems, Ms. Manning, and Ms. Hughes. All those opposed, please raise your hand. Those opposed are Ms. Riggs, Ms. Felton, Ms. Anderson, Ms. Melnick, Ms. Rye, Mr. Edwards, Ms. Holtz, and Ms. Owens. So the final vote is three in favor, seven opposed. The, mo the substitute motion did not pass. Eight opposed, three, four. The motion did not pass. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Anything else, Mrs. Manning, before we go to the next speaker? Okay, uh, we have, I'll just add, uh, I'll share a few remarks and then we have a few others in the queue and then we'll hopefully be able to vote and move on to the rest of our agenda. Uh, and for me, I just want to uh, emphasize, uh, well, let me speak first to very quickly because it keeps coming up and I'm the first to agree that this would be something we would charge with, we would hope that the uh, third party consultant would, would assess, though I think we've done our own assessing as far as the composition of the, of the equity council, but I, I don't feel we, I personally can't, can't get hung up on that. For me, the, it's relevant and it isn't because it comes down to what's, what's the product, what's in the policy. And the purpose comes out right out with the school board values, the diversity in our community and staff. It believes that all students, staff and community members, regardless of background, deserve a rigorous and respectful learning environment, et cetera. And we've already addressed in section B6, all the groups that are covered by this policy. So yes, in an ideal world, maybe we would have liked to see more of X, Y, or Z on the committee, on the council itself. But in the end, this policy is addressing all of these groups that many of us are saying it would be nice ultimately to see on the council. So that's my point about that. 
uh, and my more general remark is just that for me this is part of a continuum and it started for me as a school board member with uh, Dr. Spence within the first year or two of my service started talking about looking, viewing things through an equity lens. And I know Ms. I think it's Mrs. Felton who brought up that term earlier. And, and then, you know, starting to go to NSBA conferences. And uh, I do want to mention for just a moment uh, the, the, st the strategic planning committee that developed the Compass to 2025. And it can't be overemphasized, and Mrs. Riggs was the other school board member with me, that committee met for close to maybe eight or nine months. And I'd say a good six months of those meetings were focused on the matter at hand. The first few, it, it met monthly, and there were a few kind of organizational meetings. And, and of, a, of those six meetings, I'd say a good one, certainly half of one meeting and then a whole entire other meeting were focused on equity. And that's what led ultimately to the outcome of an equity sub-goal for each of the goals. And that, that stakeholder group did, have, did represent a really wide portion of our community. Of the 40 members, probably 25 were outside people in our community that I personally had never met. And they came from all walks of life in the community. And they were part of that commitment, that equity commitment. So I feel that's what really laid the groundwork here, where for me personally, this policy is just the next natural extension of that work. And I think that has been reiterated elsewhere this evening. So I. So with that, we'll, we have about four more in the queue, uh, Mrs. Riggs and Mrs. Anderson. I just want to uh, say one more time um, that we, Mrs. Manning and the rest of us are not being asked to vote on training curriculum. Uh, we're being asked to vote on a policy directing that training will occur. That's usually how it's done. We're not, and I've heard people say we're, putting the cart before the horse, no. You have a policy, and you go from the policy. The policy directs, and I know Dr. Parrott said that as well, and so did Dr. Spence, but I need to, I feel like I need to say it again. It's, and it stands to reason that the training needs cannot be identified until the assessment is made. And I think you pointed that out as, too, um, Carolyn, right. Um, the assessment of the current state of the school division as it relates to this equity has to occur. And the proposed policy calls for such an assessment. This proposed policy calls for a plan to be developed as a result of that assessment and for that plan to be shared with and reported on to the board on an ongoing basis, which is what we usually do. For instance, um, the school board policy 4-39 states for curriculum are textbooks. That's an example. The school board encourages employees to participate in activities that will expand the employee's knowledge and will increase professional competency, competency as well as continuing growth in skills, techniques, and human relations to the extent that the budget allows. The school board shall provide opportunities for employees to participate in activities outside the school division and shall offer in-service training programs within the school division. Again, this policy doesn't specify what kind of training it will occur, but it's a policy that leads us into that direction. So the policy comes first, and that's how we've always done. The policy comes first. You have to have policies. And so I just wanted to reiterate that as the policy chair. Mrs. Anderson and then Mrs. Weems. Thank you, Mrs. Riggs. Thank you. Um, as much as I appreciate all the people who came and spoke tonight, and, and I do appreciate all of them, including the diversity of people who came, some were not in favor, some were in favor, but I appreciate the fact that people came tonight stood in the rain and waited for hours 
and got to speak. And some of those who waited online also waited for many hours and, and then got their turn to speak. But it was a little bit, little bit disheartening to me that so many people spoke as if this policy was only about one particular race. And, and, and I want to be clear, this policy is all-encompassing, and it's not just about one particular race. It will benefit every single student, teacher, and staff member in VBCPS, every one of them. No matter what color of their skin or deficiencies of any kind that they may have. Now, this week I wrote some facts about this policy on my Facebook page. And I was brutally attacked by people who had not read the policy and who did not really even understand what educational equity is about. They had only read the opinions and misleading statements on another board member's Facebook page. And I just want to reiterate to all, those, all of our constituents out there how important it is for our constituents to be careful about jumping on an issue just because they've read someone's opinion on social media. But having been a part of the policy committee, I know this policy was not rushed. For, uh, on the policy committee itself, we spent more than two months on it. The policy committee spent more than two months in, and with the help of our, our school board attorney, the policy allows us to do an audit of our educational equity in VBCPS. And the audit or assessment will drive what we will be doing about equity in our school division, the training, the curriculum, et cetera. So um, it's the same thing we've done on most of our programs. It's what we do. We, we, we assess it, we figure out what we need, and then we fix it. And that's what this is all about. So I, I just want to say that I feel like this, this policy is something that's been needed for a long time. And, um, and I'm definitely in favor of, of how it's written and what we hopefully will be able to accomplish once we have the assessment. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Weems. Any further discussion? Okay then, uh, all those in favor of the educational equity policy, please raise your hand. Those in favor were Ms. Riggs, Ms. Felton, Ms. Anderson, Ms. Melnick, Ms. Rye, Mr. Edwards, Ms. Holtz, and Ms. Owens. And all those opposed, please raise your hand. I'm abstaining, so I'll give my reason. I do want an equity policy, but I think that this is this one's been done a little backwards. We have lack of diverse community input. I have no information about the training, the curriculum. I have no idea about the bud budget impact. Thank you, so I will abstain. Ms. Manning, how do you vote? Uh, I am abstaining because I do not have enough information to make an informed vote for my constituents and all stakeholders. Thank you. Ms. Hughes, how do you vote? I am abstaining as well because while I am in favor of an educational equity policy, uh, many questions were not answered and I do not support this as a written. Thank you. Madam Chair, we have three abstaining Ms. Weems, Ms. Manning, and Ms. Hughes. So the um, motion did pass uh, with a vote of eight. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, 